There are a ton of overrated blood sugar myths out there, and we need to cut through the noise out there because there's a lot of stuff that's completely overrated that you don't need to be worrying about as much. But on the other side of things, there's things that are way underrated that we should be paying attention to more. So let's just jump right in. The first thing that's overrated is adding fats to your carbohydrates to control a glucose spike. Now, don't get me wrong. By, say, putting some oil on your rice or something, you do absolutely lessen your glucose spike. But one of the things that we need to pay attention to is time in range. If you add fats to carbohydrates, a couple of things happen. One, you actually make that food more hyperpalatable because fats and carbs really light up different regions of the brain, making that food taste and feel better to your brain, so you end up wanting more. So the propensity to overeat in the short term could very well be higher. However, if you eat slower and you can control that, then yes, you can actually have a nice satiety aspect that comes in. But why is it overrated? Because there's a better option. The underrated option is protein. Mixing protein with carbohydrates can 2x attenuate the glucose response without the additional calories coming from fats, without the hyperpalatable effect, because when you have fats, it's the texture and the sensation that is activating a specific part of your brain. So that's what we need to look out for. Protein does not do that as much and arguably has a better impact. So prioritize protein with carbs compared to fats. The other more speculative thing, now, don't get me wrong, this isn't completely flushed out. There's early preliminary evidence, at least in rodent models, combining high amounts of fat and high amounts of carbs might lead to something called metabolic gridlock, where the body preferentially wants to run on one fuel or the other, and you've given it so much of both that it can be problematic. So just lean into the protein. The fats are fine, but fats are also caloric. So if you're having carbs, you're better off using protein. This next one could be construed a little bit weird, so I wanna make sure you hear out the entire thing. Overrated for glucose control, resistance training in the short term. Underrated, aerobic. What do I mean by this? If you go out and you do some high intensity interval training, or you go and do some resistance training, you will probably notice that your glucose actually goes up. So in the short term, because of how everything gets routed to the liver and what the liver has to pump out as far as resistance training is concerned to try to keep the process moving, you oftentimes see an increase. So as far as getting your glucose down, aerobic exercise is going to be your best option to bring your glucose levels down in the short term. That being said, I think it's pretty obvious I resistance train, so there's no way in heck that I'm saying not to. Longer term resistance training will help you metabolize glucose better. But in the short term, it's not gonna lower your glucose. Like it might a little bit, but you're much better off going for a walk or a jog or hopping on a stationary bike. I promise you. As a matter of fact, I can show you on my continuous glucose monitor right here. Look at this. Okay, that's yesterday at 7:30 a.m. That's my that's my resistance training. Look at how much I spiked. I spiked up to 134. Now let me show you. This is my sleeping, nice and low. Look what happens when I ran this morning. I did aerobic work, went down to 81. The proof is in the pudding right there. Aerobic work is going to allow you to suck up glucose much faster, but longer term, resistance training will give you more muscle and more ability to soak up glucose over the long haul, over the lifespan. FYI, the CGM that I use is called Cygnos. It's a Dexcom CGM, but the technical platform is Cygnos. So I put a link down below. That's a 15% off discount link if you wanna check them out. So it allows you to get a continuous glucose monitor so you can use that like I did. And again, you can see everything. So this allows me to monitor what I eat, like I was doing a little test with different nuts and stuff today. Anyhow, it's really, really cool. So that link gets you 15% off. And then the app allows you to sort of learn how foods are treating you or how you respond to foods. That way, if you start to have a spike, it'll tell you to go for a walk or tell you to do some air squats. It's really intuitive and it algorithmically learns as it understands how you eat, how you train, how you log your food, your exercise. It's really, really cutting edge. And there's a lot of experts that are really, really big on CGMs right now because it could be the future of understanding our metabolic health. So that link is down below. It's called Cygnos, so check them out. Next thing that's overrated is berberine. Look it, I totally understand. Like berberine is great. 300 to 500 milligrams of berberine can have a tremendous impact on your glucose. There's a downside though. 
it seems to work better for people that have worse glucose. So people that are more insulin resistant or people that are type two diabetic. It doesn't seem to have as much of an impact on people that are mildly insulin resistant or even healthy individuals trying to control their glucose. What I would recommend people do instead that has a tremendous effect is with your meals, have apple cider vinegar or lemon water or better yet, both. What this does is this actually inhibits some of the ability for the glucose to absorb to break down some of those carbohydrates more accurately. So this has a big impact. And if you look at the data, ACV and lemon water can work almost as well as berberine, but it works evenly across all people, whether you're diabetic or not. That doesn't mean don't take berberine. Like I think it works great. I was careful to craft this video in such a way that I'm not throwing anything under the bus. Like obviously fats are still good. Resistance training is still good. Berberine is still great, but pay attention to the inexpensive, easy things like apple cider vinegar or vinegar in general and lemon water. This next one is weird. You wouldn't expect it to be there, but overrated, saturated fat. Full disclaimer, if you're doing carnivore diet or something like that, this doesn't apply to you. It's a different ball game. But when carbs are in the equation, having additional saturated fat above like maybe 25% of your total fat calories is really not advantageous for you. There's some pretty solid evidence that hyper amounts of saturated fat can actually downregulate the expression and the creation of insulin receptors. So it can make it so insulin receptors do not receive a signal from insulin as well. I don't care if it's animal-based, plant-based saturated fat or whatever, I really don't. That's not the point here. This is not, no agenda. I eat a lot of meat. The point is, is that too much saturated fat with too much carbs is problematic. And people tend to say, oh, saturated fats are gonna attenuate glucose. But in reality, that also downregulates the ability for ATP to generate, which ends up triggering a mitochondrial disadvantage that makes it difficult to process glucose. There's a lot of evidence backing this up. So what's underrated? Candidly, what's underrated are monounsaturated fats, omega-7s like in macadamia nuts, which have huge promise when it comes down to glucose metabolism, huge promise when it comes down to insulin receptor cell expression, when it comes down to beta cell production, all these things that actually allow us to produce insulin effectively. So what do I suggest here? Add olive oil, add avocado oil, add macadamia nut oil, add these oils. Don't just try to get saturated fat because it's not a carb. Try to go for the olive, the avocado, straight up olives, straight up avocados, whole macadamia nuts, any source of monounsaturated fats, because it's not just a short-term benefit, it's a long-term benefit. This next one's a plot twist as well. Overrated, low glycemic carbs. Okay, hear me out on this. Glycemic index is important. Okay, but we also have to factor in two things, glycemic load and time in range. Okay, a perfect example is when I was doing a continuous glucose monitor test with various nuts, I had these nuts along with some nuts that had sugar in them. And because the sugar was digesting slower because of the combination of the nuts with it, my glucose was spiking very slowly, but it was staying out of range for a long time. So imagine this, let's say someone gives you some brown rice and you eat it and you spike out of range, but you stay out of range because it takes a long time to break those carbs down. Even though you're not spiking high, you're spiking high enough to be out of range. But then a couple hours goes by and it's time to eat again. So you have more brown rice and you just had another bell curve on top of another bell curve. By the end of the day, you're like, wait a minute, I've been eight hours out of my healthy range, even though I haven't been spiking super high. So you know what's underrated? Calculating your time in range. What do I mean by that? If your system is working well and your body is doing what it's supposed to do, you could go and have something high glycemic and you'll come back down relatively fast. We really, really undervalue the natural ability for insulin to do its job. Instead, we demonize it, and that really throws a wrench in everything. So it is underrated to focus on how long you're in range. Don't worry as much about acute spikes if you're coming back down the way that you should, because that means your body's doing what it's supposed to do. And now kind of a fun one. What's really overrated is avoiding chocolate because there's a couple grams of sugar in it. This is pretty wild. What's underrated are the polyphenols in chocolate. There's even some evidence that suggests that even dark chocolate with a little bit of sugar, the polyphenols actually counteract the sugar by increasing the expression of some of these beta cells. So it's allowing us to produce more insulin, but it's improving insulin sensitivity in other ways. So I put this as sort of a fun one where don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as I always say. 
enjoy some dark chocolate as long as it's legitimate dark chocolate and don't completely throw it under the bus. It has some benefits. I'll see you tomorrow.